It's me, Brianna. Not you. That's what my latest boyfriend told me, before walking directly into the path of a truck. There was barely anything left of him, just enough to peel him off of the sidewalk. I thought our relationship was going well. It's not like I'm desensitized to my boyfriend's dying, or ceasing to exist, but it's almost become the norm. Ben was my first boyfriend in high school, and my longest relationship to date. Fluffy-haired Ben, with his dimpled grin and freckles. He was the type of guy who should have been popular, but chose to keep to himself. I met him in the principal's office. Ben was being lectured for sneaking around, and I was handing in a late assignment. All he did was wink at me, and I fell. Hard. We dated for two years. I really thought he was the one. Ben told me he loved me, and every Friday he introduced me to a new restaurant. I was in love. I loved everything about him. On the night before our senior prom, a drunk driver t-boned my boyfriend's car, killing him instantly. After his funeral, it's like he stopped existing. His parents left town, and every time I mentioned him, my parents would slowly tilt their heads and act confused when I brought him up. My brother was the worst for it, considering he and Ben were best friends. But he just looked at me with this weird fucking look in his eye, like his soul had been ripped out. Eyes are the windows to the soul, apparently, and my brother's soul was MIA. Ben? His expression crumpled. Wait, who? Alex was my emotional support, who later became someone closer. Funny Alex. Blonde but not quite blonde Alex. I met him in group therapy. My boyfriend was dead, and he had just lost his mother. We didn't label it, because he had a girlfriend, and I didn't want to move on so quickly. I think we just found comfort in each other. Eventually though, Alex became something I wanted to label. His sense of humor was a breath of fresh air. I didn't go to college because of Ben's death, settling for a mediocre barista stop in town. Alex came in every day with fresh coffee and a sugar cookie. I think I loved him. I told him that. Half asleep, I told him I wanted to try and be something more with him. Alex looked taken aback, but happy. We spent the night together. The morning after, I woke to my mother screaming. Alex was dead in the bathroom, his blood splattering, staining pristine white. According to the first responders, he died of a self-inflicted head injury. The exact same thing followed. I attended his funeral, and Alex's family disappeared. This time, I went back to his house, but according to a neighbor, his house had been abandoned for ten years. I had eaten pancakes in his kitchen just days earlier. I broke in to see it myself, but my neighbor was right. The hallway was piled with ancient mail and threats of eviction. Alex's room didn't exist. Instead, a storage room filled with boxes. When I got home, my family had already forgotten Alex's existence. The town had forgotten him 
and yet his blood still stained my bathroom. Following Alex's death, I was terrified of getting too close to people. But Esme made it hard. She was my third relationship. We met at a bar. I was extremely drunk and convinced I was cursed to kill all of my romantic partners. Esme. Cute Esme. Crooked teeth and smudged lipstick. And warm Esme. Do you know that person you meet and you instantly connect with them? The person you're sure is your soulmate? That was Esme. I told myself I wouldn't get too close to her, but I was already talking to this girl, already pouring my life out to her. Esme sat and listened, her chin resting on her fist. She was a first year creative writing student, and she had a cat called Peanut. I didn't remember her much after that. We hit it off, and the next thing I know we're curled up in the back of her car, watching Buffy on her iPad. I told her about my exes, and she nodded and smiled, but I don't think she was listening. I told her all of my exes have died, and then been erased from existence. Esme called me cute. She wanted to base a story around the concept sitting up and grabbing her phone. I have this memory of the girl I fell in love with at first sight. She's nodding along to a Smith song, spluttering from my car radio, typing on her phone. I can hear the tapping of her nails, her lips curving into a smile. I can see the exact moment she gets inspiration, pulling her knees to her chest. She's wearing fishnet tights that are torn, and a jacket that doesn't fit her. She is beautiful, and I don't want to lose her. Alex was beautiful. He had pretty eyes and brown curls that I liked running my hands through. Ben was beautiful. He made my heart swim, my stomach swarm with butterflies when I first met him. Ben was my first love. The realization woke me up one night, three months into dating Esme. Both of them were dead, wiped away like they never existed. And Esme would follow. At first, I tried to break it off with her without sounding crazy. I told her it was me, not her and I wasn't in the mindset for a relationship. Esme understood, but her eyes didn't. I didn't want to lose her. Esme lit up every room she entered. Her obsession with thrifted clothes and badly written poems, and her irrational fear of pandas, made her someone I wanted to be with. So... I stayed with her. I told myself Ben and Alex were just coincidences that were nothing to do with me, and I wasn't indirectly fucking killing the people I fell in love with. I avoided the L word for as long as I could. But it slipped out on my way to work. Esme was driving. I just said it and her eyes lit up. She reached out and squeezed my hand. At work, one of my colleagues, Jasper, caught my eye. When I twisted around to ask him to grab something, I glimpsed his phone screen. It looked like Tinder, though I didn't recognize the layout. It reminded me of Twitter, in dark mode. Jasper was leaning against the counter, his thumb hovering over a photo of Esme, chewing his bottom lip. I watched his thumb prance around the screen, 
before he gave up and swiped left. Finishing up the woman's coffee, I handed it over. Uh, I asked for cream? Ignoring her, I sidled in front of my colleague, hyper-focused on whatever app he was playing around with. What's that? Jasper looked up, his eyes widening, lips parting, like a fucking goldfish. Clearly nothing. Jasper sidestepped me, opening the refrigerator and pulling out milk. But he already had milk. The bastard was stalling. We had zero customers waiting, so it was just the two of us, and a long, dragged out pause. Jumping up and down on the heels of his feet, he shot me his usual grin, slipping his phone into his apron. Jasper may have been smiling, though there was something twisted in his expression. I couldn't stop myself. Was that a dating app? Dating app? Excuse me, can I get what I ordered? The woman demanded, waving her coffee in the air. I asked for whipped cream. Jasper saw that as an excuse, an escape, and nodded, fashioning a grin. He saw an opportunity and took it. Of course, ma'am. I'll get that for you. He said, with a little too much sarcasm. The boy took her coffee with a spring in his step, ducking in the refrigerator for the whipped cream. Jasper added too much cream, dumping the drink on the counter with a little too much force. It was a good thing my colleague was marginally an attractive guy, with cropped blonde hair and a deadpan voice that somehow attracted the ladies. Jasper could insult someone directly to their face, and they would just blush and get all tongue-tied. I had seen it happen in real time. A girl was flirting with him, and used a bad pickup line, which was something along the lines of, Did it hurt when you fell from heaven? He laughed, and her eyes brightened. She giggled along with him, nudging her friends. But he wasn't laughing with her. I saw the gleam in his eye. He was laughing at her. Still laughing, Jasper plonked her milk latte down so hard half of it spewed out. And with the exact same charming smile, he deadpanned. Did it hurt when you dropped out of a drain pipe? Yeah, my colleague was blessed with good looks. Otherwise, he would have been punched in the face by now. Presently, he was being his usual arsehole self. Is there anything else I can get you? The woman shook her head, pulling a face. Jasper had, essentially, ruined her drink. It was more cream than coffee now. When she left the store, I situated myself in front of him when he was counting cash. What were you looking at? I nodded to his phone sticking out of his pocket. Was it like a dating site you were on? Jasper didn't even look at me, his lip curling. That's kind of rude. He hummed. I don't peek at your phone. Esme Hope was all I could hiss out. Was she on that dating app? My colleague proceeded to stare at me like I'd grown a second head, before his half-idled gaze flickered behind me. Jasper's expression brightened. Oh, Hannah is calling me. He said, choking out a laugh. Hannah was not calling him. She was in the break room getting high. Jasper slowly backed away, maintaining his smile. I'll be back in a second, alright? 
he grabbed that same carton of milk with a grin. Don't you just love when your milk stays fresh? What? Fresh milk? He grinned. Mulberry Farm's finest. Jasper was darting away before I could coerce a sentence. After work, I texted Esme as usual. She was my ride on Fridays. Esme didn't reply. I texted her again, a little more panicked. Hey, are you okay? When I called her, an automated voice told me she wasn't available. Already feeling sick to my stomach, I drove to her place myself. I could see the flashing lights before anything else, blurred red and blue sending my thoughts into a whirlwind. It took me ten minutes to muster the courage to jump out of my car and ask a pale-looking deputy what was going on. I tried to jump over the yellow tape, only to be politely pulled back. Carbon monoxide poisoning, the deputy told me. The whole family is dead. He sighed. Mom, dad, and their daughter in college. I think he was trying to be sympathetic, awkwardly patting me. But I was already on my knees. All of the breath dragged from my lungs. Luckily... It's just like going to sleep. Monoxide is a silent killer. Monoxide is a silent killer. Was that the same as... I'm sorry, Ben was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And Alex was silently suffering. He did what he thought was best. I didn't go to Esme's funeral. Mum and Dad and Will had already forgotten her, just like the others. What I did do, several days later, when her name wasn't even a memory anymore, I bought flowers from the store. Roses were Esme's favourite. The seller was around my mum's age, a plump-looking woman wearing a floral dress, long red hair tied into a ponytail. She was on her phone, humming to a tune on the radio. The Smiths. I hope she likes them, the woman said, wrapping the flowers in red ribbons. She had a strong southern accent that immediately annoyed me. I took the roses, stuffing them in my bag. What did you say? The seller cocked her head. Hmm? How did you know they were for my girlfriend? The woman sighed, placing her phone on the counter. I glanced at whatever she'd been so interested in, but the screen was face down. Esme came in here a lot. Her lips broke out into a sad, sympathetic smile. I was quickly growing sick of them. Esme, she, uh, she told me you guys were dating. Esme was always buying roses for her room. Sometimes she would stand in here for hours and just stare at the flowers. I think she found comfort in them. The woman sighed, fixing me with what I could only describe as a pitiful pout. Ugh. I hope you can find the same comfort. She murmured. The seller handed me an extra rose. And I found myself reaching out for it. My eyes stinging. Fuck. I hadn't cracked in at least 15 hours. And that was a record. But now I could feel myself splintering. Tears trickling down my cheeks. The flower lady squeezed my hand. I'm sorry, sweetheart. If it makes you feel better, 
It's just like going to sleep. Monoxide is a silent killer. Her words were familiar. Exactly what the deputy said. Before I could speak, she dumped weed killer on the counter. Did you know our plant killer is $10.99? Her sudden bout of energy took me off guard. I tried to smile. I don't want any plant killer, thanks. The seller nodded, handing me another rose. Oh, of course, darling. But it is five ninety nine just for today. Something prickled me, and I hissed out, wafting my hand. Damn thorns. I could already see a single spot of blood. I nodded, sucking my teeth against a cry. Thanks, but I'll skip it this time. I took the roses to what used to be Esme's grave. Now, it was an empty headstone with no name, no memories, no flowers, nothing. Just like Alex and Ben, Esme had been reduced to dirt under my feet. I stayed at her grave for a long time, long enough for the sky to grow dark, and my thoughts even darker. I tried to find a logical explanation for the sudden deaths of the people I got close to, but all I could think of was that I was cursed. So, I started googling curses, leaning against Esme's headstone, my knees to my chest. Had I been cursed? Was my family cursed? According to Google, a cursed object connected with the curse itself. Which could be anything, though I didn't remember visiting any ancient ruins or an old church. With zero answers, I headed home. I passed a guy playing the Smiths in his car, then a group of older women wearing ripped fishnet tights. Esme was following me, just like Alex's smell, fresh coffee and rich chocolate. Ben's cologne filled my car last summer, his favourite band was playing all day on our local music station. I drove around with no destination, listening to each one on repeat, until I was losing him all over again. The sweet aroma of flowers followed me all the way home, and I was tipsy on the smell, when I found myself face to face with a boy. Under the overexposed streetlight, this guy was almost a Theral thick brown hair and freckles. He reminded me of Ben, which wasn't fair. I thought I was hallucinating him before he came closer, bleeding from the shadow. I saw more of him, white strips of something wrapped around his head. Wrong. The word slammed into me when I glimpsed his clothes. Filthy. The guy was wearing a white button-down, a single streak of bright red ingrained into the material. His white pants were torn, glued to his legs. He was barefoot, the soles of his feet slapping on wet concrete. I didn't realize he was in front of me, nose to nose until he shoved me, hard. Josie. His voice was a whimper, despite his narrowed eyes, his lips twisted into a scowl. He was crying, every heaving word sputtering from his mouth. The boy shoved me again, and I staggered. His ice-cold breath grazed my cheeks. What the fuck did you do to my sister? Sister? 
I whispered. Something wet landed on my cheek suddenly. Rain. I wasn't expecting a downpour. The weather was forecasted to be clear. To my surprise, the guy lit out a harsh sounding laugh. The two of us were slowly getting drenched, but neither of us were making a move to get out of the rain. My hair was glued to the back of my neck, my clothes sticking to me. But somehow, I wanted to stay in the rain. It was so refreshing. When a thought hit me, telling me to get out of the rain, it was shoved to the back of my mind. The guy spat water out of his mouth, shaking his head like a dog. Of course, he muttered. Drown me out with the rain. I eventually found my voice, my gaze glued to intense red seeping through the bandage stapled to his head. He looked like he'd escaped from an emergency room. I don't know anyone called Josie, I said. I think you've got the wrong person. The guy's eyes narrowed. He stepped closer, grabbing my shoulders and I noticed how hollow his eyes were. Empty cabins carved into his skull. Eyes are the window to the soul. And this guy was completely soulless. I'm only going to say this once, he whispered. What did you do to my sister? Before I could respond, the guy was being violently grabbed and dragged back. Figures who appeared seemingly out of nowhere. Let me go. Let me go. He cried out, struggling. You fucking assholes. Let me go. His screaming became muffled when his cries were gagged. You promised. You promised. He yelled his cries collapsing into a sob. You said if you took me, she wouldn't get hurt. So where is she? He met my gaze, his expression crumpling, something inside of him coming apart, splintering by the seams. You can't take both of us. This wasn't in the agreement. This wasn't in the agreement. When he was dragged further back, I noticed a car parked at the side of the road. The boy was pulled inside. At first he refused, before an extra pair of hands shoved him in. I heard his fists slamming into the windows. I heard his cries once again, collapsed into an angry muffled scream, and I felt my hands moving towards my pocket for my phone. This was a kidnapping, right? I was witnessing a kidnapping in broad fucking daylight. A shadow was suddenly in front of me, and I jumped, tearing my eyes from the car. Jasper, my colleague, he was still wearing his apron, and to my confusion, was swinging a carton of whole milk. Sorry, Bree. He winked, speaking in a single breath. As you can see, our friend here had a little too much to drink. I nodded, craning my neck. Jasper stepped in front of me, maintaining a grin. Who is he? This time, I sidestepped away from him only for him to copy. Just a guy, he said. As you can see, he's a little... Jasper prodded his right temple. Let's just say he's got a few too many screws loose. Jasper laughed, staying stock still, blocking my way. When I made a move to counter him, he stepped in front of me, 
his eyes hardening. I heard he lost his family a while ago in a... He pretended to think. Oh, yeah. A car crash. Maybe a gas explosion. I'm not really sure. I could hear the car behind him. And once again, I tried to dart past him. But he was quick to block my way. He was getting closer to me, very subtly backing me into the opposite direction. Anyway, this guy is kinda nuts. Dude still thinks he's got a sister. When I lost patience and shoved him out of the way, the car and the guy were gone. See? Jasper rolled his eyes. He was still holding milk from work. My head spun. It was 8pm. We were in a suburban neighborhood, and Jasper was holding half a pint of milk. His apron was stained with coffee. And when I really looked at him, I realized he was out of breath. He was doing a good job of hiding it, exhaling in intervals, swiping at his forehead to clear sweat. When I noticed, he pretended to run his hands through his hair. I, uh, I feel for him. Like, I'm sorry his family died, or whatever. But attacking random girls isn't cool, you know? Instead of replying, I stumbled home. It was sunny. At 8 p.m. And when I took notice, I wasn't even wet. Esme was the last straw. I made a promise to myself to not get close to anyone. The guys and girls I met were friends, and nothing more. Weirdly enough, the only guy I was getting close to was my colleague. I don't know if it was brain damage or if I was finally losing the plot, but Jasper's shameless cruelty towards customers and that quirk in his lips when he made them cry was kind of hot. However, he was playing hard to get, and I mean really playing. I was in storage trying to find vegan milk. And he was suddenly a fucking expert, spewing milk facts. When I slammed the refrigerator door shut, he was inches from my face. In the dim light from a single sputtering bulb, his eyes reminded me of coffee grounds. I thought maybe he was going to kiss me, judging from his softening expression. I felt his hands go around my waist and I felt myself immediately melt. I don't know what came over me. It's like, one minute I hated him, and the next, it got very hot. Really hot. And I really wanted to take my clothes off. I thought that's what he wanted to do. I mean, his gaze followed mine, piercing, fingers playing with the buttons on his shirt, before he leaned forward, his breath in my face. Did you know that Mulberry Farms is an award-winning brand of milk in our town, and only our town? Mulberry Farms was bred and made right here. And suddenly, I was no longer hot and bothered. I didn't, I said, ducking into a crouch to search the shelves. Have you seen our vegan milk? We did have some. Three-time winner, Jasper continued. When I jumped up, he stepped closer, and I felt my cheeks spark. His smile was rare. In fact, Jasper was only smiling when he was talking about milk. 
Mulberry farms have the best pasteurization. It's suitable for everything. Coffee, cereal, or maybe you just want a glass of fresh milk to yourself. Perfect for kids, too. Breakfast time is Mulberry Farms. Are you having a stroke? I whisper shrieked. No. Jasper twisted around, shooting me a grin. I left the storage, however, with butterflies in my gut. There was no way I was falling for my asshole colleague. Somehow, though, I was. Just standing next to him filled me with electricity. The way he talked down to customers, insulting me to my face. I was thoroughly and disgustingly in love. I tried to stop myself. I showered in ice cold water. I ate, choked on a ghost pepper. I even asked my brother for advice, who told me to go for it. I told him Jasper had one of several flaws, but this particular one was off-putting. He's obsessed with milk, I told my brother. Harry lifted a brow. Is that a euphemism, or... He paused for way longer than necessary. So, your would-be boyfriend has a milk fetish? I left his room before he could take that conversation any further. I wanted to say Jasper was the only one who acted weird. But over the next few weeks, I noticed it in quite a few people. I was having breakfast with my mum, and she lifted up the box. Choco Flakes she blurted. Aren't they just the best? I nodded slowly. Yeah, mum, they're great. I prodded the box with a smile. Only a dollar ninety-nine. There were so many townspeople on their phones. They walked around with groceries or briefcases, their eyes glued to whatever they were swiping through. I was serving an old woman when I caught her phone screen. I could have sworn there was an image of Jasper. She swiped right, and I had a hard time looking her in the eye. The woman was at least in her eighties, and I'm talking can barely walk without assistance. Was she seriously hitting up twenty-five-year-old guys? Walking home, everyone was on their phones. I stopped at a crossing, stabbing the red light. It started to snow the second I stepped out onto the road, white flakes dancing in front of me. It didn't even cross my mind that it was almost June. The snow was pretty, accumulating on the ground. Oh, shit, sorry. Lifting my head, a guy was standing in front of me holding an umbrella. I knew him, but not from whatever was trying to pollute my mind. I knew him from a while ago. I knew him from the rain. I knew the bloody bandages wrapped around his head and soulless, seething eyes I couldn't understand. It was the boy who was dragged away three months prior. He looked different. His hair was shorter, his face carved into a thing of beauty. The white strips of gauze bleeding scarlet were gone, his filthy clothes replaced with a white shirt and pants, a trench coat flung over the top. I didn't remember him being this handsome. His dark brown hair had been tamed and curled. It was his expression that sent shivers sliding down my spine. His too wide smile and unblinking eyes made me suddenly conscious of two bright lights on the two of us. 
so bright. Something shattered in my mind, and I was aware of a lot of things. The snow under my feet was too soft. I glimpsed a single streak of red seeping from his nose, his hands trembling around a takeout coffee cup. Behind me, people were staring. I could see a group of teenage girls giggling. It's him. One of them squeaked. It's the new love interest. Bree? Bree? His grin widened, snowflakes prancing around us, his teeth gritted together. I could tell he hated every word. Holy shit, long time no see. He held out his hand, and I could see visible pain contorting in his eyes. Help me, he was screaming through a twinkling smile. Don't, don't you remember me? It's, it's a, uh, it's Sam. He laughed. From eighth grade. The lights blinked out, and the thought came crashing into my mind. Static images filling my head. I shook them away. Oh, yeah. It was Sam. My childhood friend. But I didn't reply. Instead of saying, Sam, it's been so long. I found myself walking, stumbling over to the girls, who were rapidly swiping left on their phones. What's that? I demanded in a sharp breath. I grabbed for the phone, only for Sam to step in front of me. He settled me with a smile. Behind me, one of the girls fainted. Sam's smile didn't waver, though he did side-eye the girl being carried away. Why don't I take you out for coffee? Apparently, coffee was the code word for hooking up. Sam dragged me into the nearest coffee store, straight to the bathroom. When he shoved me into a stall, I didn't know what to say. Take off your shoes, he said in a hiss, and after hesitating, I did. Sam pulled off his jacket, shook snow out of his hair, and got real close. Look up, he murmured. I did, my gaze finding the ceiling. To your right, a camera is very well hidden but can be seen with the naked eye if you catch what looks like a red laser. Sam said. <clears throat> to your left, another camera, as well as a vent that is currently pumping the stores with aphrodisiacs. And right now, we are in the red zone, meaning you should be unconscious. Again, <sighs> meaning you should be conscious. He prodded me, and I flinched. Mostly conscious. His words went right over my head. My mind was foggy. I couldn't think straight. I think I asked him what he was saying, but my mouth was filled with cotton. Snap out of it, he said. Like I said, they're making you feel like this. He shoved me against the door, which broke me out of my trance, slightly. I hate what I'm going to say right now. Sam groaned, tipping his head back. He was sweating, I noticed. Bad. I glimpsed... I glimpsed beads of red pulling down his neck. He noticed me staring. I'm okay for now. I'm faulty, so the connection is severed. He squeezed his eyes shut. I... I think. What are you talking about? Sex. He said, 
blinking rapidly. I wasn't going to comment on his slurring voice. Sam stumbled, fresh blood dripping from his nose. We... we, we need to do the sex. Like... His eyes rolled into the back of his head, but he managed to stabilize himself. N now What? Is everything okay in there? The voice was a woman. She knocked on the store. Sam's eyes widened, coming back to life a little. They're paranoid, he whispered. When I could only stare at him, he pounded his fists on the door. They... they need to think we're fucking... He hissed. So we need to make it believable. They... I mouthed. He didn't reply, swiping at his hemorrhaging nose. Just... move around against the door. That'll fool him. I did doing my best to shuffle around, slamming my back against the lock. When the metal clanged, he shot me a look. Sex, he said. Not murder. Sam jumped onto the toilet bowl. There was an open window above him. That's enough, he mouthed, hoisting his way through. He helped me through and I was expected to land on concrete. What I did land on, however, was something... squishy. Something wet sliding between my bare toes. Looking closer, I recognized the beaded anklet, fishnet tights. Something animalistic clawed from my throat. I was standing on Esme, or what was left of Esme. She was just a torso and legs, the rest of her ripped away like doll pieces. I couldn't see her face. I looked for it, digging through what could only be old flesh and pieces of limbs. I felt suffocated. I grabbed half of Ben's face that had been ripped off, and then Alex's tattooed arm. There was so much of them. Piles and piles of the same heads, the same filthy and rotting clothes. I was screaming by the time I shuffled back on my hands and knees, trying to wipe them off of my skin. They were all over me, staining me, painting me. Sam's hand, slick with blood, gently covered my mouth. Stay calm, all right? He whispered. I would tell you everything is going to be okay, but the truth is, it's really not. There's like a 99.9% .9 chance you're going to understandably freak out. He pulled me to my feet, letting out a heavy breath. Blinking rapidly, I could only see pieces pieces of people. Legs and heads and torsos, all piled into one mass of gore. We've got maybe five minutes before they realize we're not doing the devil's dance. Sam sniffled. Maybe ten before my brain short circuits and I bleed out. I didn't know I was hyperventilating until I couldn't fucking breathe. Closer towards the door, and I could hear... machinery. I couldn't stop myself, even when I was aware I was standing in congealing blood. Rotten bodies. The dim light led me into what could only be described as a factory. There were three levels, and we were on the highest. Sam stepped forward, gripping the metal bar in front of us. I felt my legs buckling, a thick, pukey slime filling my mouth. So, 
I guess it all started when Brianna Timberman was 17 years old and rejected by her childhood best friend, Sam Thwaites. Sam's words collapsed into a low buzzing in my ear. All I could see was a conveyor belt filled with people, boys, girls, but most noticeably, Ben's, Alex's, Esme's, and Sam's. I could see regular people, their hair stripped away, their skin sliced into, cruelly moulding them into the exact same four faces. When a large looming needle plunged into the back of an Alex's head, I couldn't not watch. I waited for the guy to wake up, but I don't even think he was alive. He stood, unblinking, letting this thing twist and contort its face. And it was then, when I realized these things weren't even human. I could see the mechanics built under their flesh, both living tissue and metal. Both living tissue and metal melded together. Brianna's father, who is a little on the crazy side, with too much cash and not enough logic, took his daughter's rejection a little too personally. Sam continued. So, he promised his daughter he would find her the perfect match. I started to speak, the words coming out before I could stop them. My father would never- I didn't say it was your father. Sam said. His eyes darkened. Anyway, as I was saying, the townspeople became unhelpfully obsessed with who Brianna would choose. So obsessed, in fact, that the girl's day-to-day life was broadcasted across town, while her potential love interests were ranked, week after week. First, there was Ben. Sam's smile thinned. Her high school boyfriend. Sam shrugged. She grew bored of him. Also, he kinda did something unforgivable. He continued. Then, Alex. She liked him, but sometimes he was a little too unserious. The guy was a clown. I backed away, but he was quick to grab my shoulders. Finally, Esme, who she truly fell for. I swallowed. Esme is... He cut me off, but I didn't mention that they hurt her, did I? Sam leaned against the bar. Behind him, I could see a figure in white pushing a gurney with a Ben strapped to it. Ben tried to assault her, insisting she wanted it. Alex dumped her on her birthday. Esme ended their relationship with a one-word text. Goodbye. Sam mimed an explosion. That was the nail in the coffin. I caught blood sliding down his nose. You're still bleeding. Sam gingerly prodded his nose. Ah, yeah, it's an effect of the severing. I've been in the red zone too long. I should probably speed this up. He talked faster, his voice collapsing into a mumbled slur. Brianna couldn't take it. Her best friend was ignoring her. Everyone she had fallen in love with hurt her. Esme wasn't returning her calls. Ben was sleeping around right in front of her. And Alex was still being a clown. Brianna's poor parents found her hanging from her bedroom ceiling fan. I shook my head. My thoughts screaming. No. 
No. He held a finger up to shush me. Let me talk. Jesus. Sam folded his arms. A grieving father would do anything to avenge his dead child. But Mr. Timberman took finding a perfect match, and the show must go on a, a little bit too literally. His sickly smile found me. Which also means going stark fucking crazy. The town wanted more of Brianna and her life, so he turned his daughter's failed love life into a town-wide TV show, sending the entire teen and young adult populace into here. He gestured around him. To make the perfect suitors. Who wouldn't hurt his new Brianna? Something ice cold crept down my spine. He cleared his throat. Mr. Timberman grew, let's say, obsessed with getting revenge on these specific four people. So he started killing them. He coughed. I'm sorry. Us. Killing us for the funny, ha ha, look at how many times I can fuck with them bit. And then recycling us into someone completely different. Our names are gone. Then our personalities. Finally, our bodies ripped to pieces and sculpted into Brianna's exes. Sam poked me in the cheek. The cycle continues. They reset your ticker, and the town eats it up. They can bring back Esme, Ben, and Alex whenever they want, and add curveballs. Like the bad boy colleague who becomes the fan favorite. Sam's lips curved. For some fucking reason. His eyes flickered open. However, Brianna will never find a suitor, because her father is a fucking sociopath. To him and the town, his dead daughter's pathetic love life is entertainment. He held out his arm. See? I tried really hard not to look through the makeup at noticeable skin grafts. I was a Ben, he said. Then I was an Alex, and then I was an extra. His eyes found mine, sad suddenly. But who I was originally is gone. All I remember is a deal to protect Josie. I gave myself up so they wouldn't take her. Your sister? I said. Sam nodded. His earlier words hit me. He was talking like Brianna Timberman was dead. But I was Brianna Timberman. I was rejected by Sam, yes, but I found Ben. As if he could read my mind, Sam shook his head. Look at yourself, he said his voice shaking. And I mean, really, look at yourself. Sam stepped closer. Because underneath all of that makeup, and the prosthetics, and surgery, and fucked up memories, you're just another recycled lump of flesh. He prodded my temple. Who thinks she is Brianna Timberman? His voice was slurring again, a fresh stream of scarlet seeping down his chin. Do you want to know? His eyes rolled to pearly whites. Before he could finish his sentence, Sam dropped to the ground. I remember warm arms grasping hold of me, shadows with no faces. They pricked me twice in the back of my neck. A familiar voice in my ear, almost a hiss. 
Jasper. You are the worst fucking Brianna. When I came to, I was standing up, somehow, at work. I am Brianna Timberman. The thought floated around my head, my memory hazy. Hello? A man was waving his hands in front of me. I ask for an iced coffee, lady. Jasper was serving another customer. Bree, wake the fuck up. They were trying to make me think I was hallucinating, which was crazy, because my fingernails were still tinted with Sam's blood. The marks he'd left on my wrist when he was yanking me were still there, bruised on my arm. Bree. Jasper snapped. Snap out of it, and make the dude his drink. Right. The word slipped out of my mouth. He caught my eye, winking, and Brianna Timberman internally squeaked. I half wondered what he was. Was he recycled, or an unwilling performer? Throughout the day, I was fully aware my words were not mine, like I was an autopilot. But not just that, my thoughts weren't mine either. I spent half of my shift staring at my colleagues' biceps. During my break, I went into the bathroom and stood in front of the mirror. I am Brianna Timberman. But even when I told myself that, my eyes were too blue, my smile was too perfect, my teeth too white, my shaking hands prodded at my face, at someone else's face. So many faces, so many skin grafts. The thought was violent, sending tremors through me. How many people was I wearing? I started to claw at my arms and legs, my face. How many fucking people had I been? I grabbed a knife and tried to slice at my face. But there was no blood. How could there be no blood? When I got home, I found my family waiting for me. Mum, Dad and Harry, all of them beaming. Bree. Mum stood up, her lips stretching into a grin. My mouth was already moving, but they were not my words. Mum. I didn't know why she was smiling so much, until I saw Sam sitting at our dining room table. His smile was too big. His over-expensive shirt and pants did not suit him, and looked fucking gross. But somehow, my brain thought it was hot. The worst part is, I couldn't and still can't tell which Sam he was. Was he the guy who told me the horrific reality of my existence? Or was he another recycled mindless suitor? This is Samuel, Mum said, and Sam slowly stood. He took slow steps towards me and kissed my hand. I saw the slightest smudge of scarlet in his lips, but his eyes were blank. In the corner of my eye, my father's eyes were glittering. Hello, Brianna, Sam said and I swore now that I was awake. The walls were wolf whistling, laughing. Crowds cheered, cooed, whistled. My town is a blip on the map. We're so small, so insignificant. Not even a Google search will find us. I keep thinking, If I tear at my skin, 
I will find who I am underneath. But I'm so fucking scared. I don't bleed. I don't think who I was still exists under so many layers. But even if this is just a cry into the void, please help us. I don't want to be Brianna Timberman. <laughs>